Meditating is like trying to catch a criminal, someone who's been creating a lot of trouble, stealing things, killing things, killing people. And you have an idea where the criminal is, but you want to catch the criminal in action. So think of when police stake out a joint. They have to get someone who's there all the time to watch the criminal come and go, and expect that they won't see much. There'll be long periods when nothing happens, and they have to learn how not to get bored and get inattentive, because sometimes the criminal can slip in, slip out very quickly. In the same way, you're trying to watch the mind to see where your defilements come from, how they slip out. Even though you're trying your best not to let the defilements come out, they come out as they want to, and they slip back. And all too often you're not aware of them until they're really full-blown. By that time it's really hard to deal with them, and really hard to understand them. How is it that the mind shapes these things? It's not totally the influence of past actions. I mean, past actions have a role to play, of course. But there's also your present moment of complicity. You've got to watch out for that. So as when police take out a joint, one, you have to be very quiet and not get bored by the quiet. In fact, boredom is one of the first things you've got to learn how to, to deal with. It seems strange that we try so hard to get the mind to settle down. And then once it's there, you say, okay, what's next? And that voice that says, what's next, has to be answered with, this is what's next. We're going to settle in here. One of the reasons why we work with the breath is to give us something to do, partly so we can settle in comfortably, and then so we have a few skills up our sleeve so that when Thoughts do begin to appear. You're sensitive to them not only on the mental side, but also the physical side, because there's a physical side to each thought. It's one of the reasons why people who do work that involves a lot of thinking can be so tired at the end of the day. I was reading a Chinese medical text one time saying that mental work takes three times as much out of your body as physical labor. So we focus on the breath, and the breath energy is in the body. As the Buddha says, you want to be aware of the entire body. Because some people interpret that as being entirely aware of the whole length of the breath. In which case they say the word body there means the body of the breath. Well, the body of the breath is not just the length of the breath at one spot in the body. It's the whole body, because the whole body is breathing. In fact, that's a good perception to hold in mind, that every cell in your body is breathing in breathing out, and you want everybody to be breathing together. See what happens when you hold that perception in mind. You get more and more familiar to subtle breath energies in the body, places where the energy is blocked, and learn which blockages you can work through easily, and which ones are more resistant. The resistant ones often are very tender, sensitive parts of your body-mind complex. And you've forced them into that little pod of tension, and so they don't trust you. So one of the ways you learn to get them to open up is to be very gentle with them and don't Go directly at them, work around them, and content yourself for the time being with the fact that you can make parts of the body comfortable. In John Lee's images of going into a house where the floorboards are, have some rotten spots, you accept that fact and just make sure you don't lie down in the rotten spots. There's plenty of room in the house where you can lie down, where the floorboards are solid. 
and in the course of working through these energies, you get more sensitive to how things form. This formation of a thought that is both a physical side and a mental side. The breath is the ideal place to see this. Because after all, it is a physical property, but of the physical properties, it's closest to the mind and the one that's most sensitive to what's going on in the mind. So when a thought comes up, you see that it reverberates both in the body and in the mind. And you make up your mind that you're not going to, as I say in Thai, weave or continue the weave of the thought. As soon as a thought is a has appeared, you zap it. In other words, you take that skill you have of breathing through patterns of tension, and wherever you sense any tension around the thought, and you don't have to even think of whether it's physical or mental tension at that point, but there's an act of construction, an act of fabrication, it's beginning to put things together, and there's going to be some tension there, going to be some stress there. Breathe right through it. And then wait. Be quiet for a while. And then something else will begin to form. You zap that. And then be a part of the mind that says, Well, this is getting boring or this is kind of dumb. You're not thinking about anything. I'll zap that one too. And try to catch these things as quickly as you can. Because you think about the Buddha's analysis of why we suffer, it's because of craving. And there are three kinds of craving. There's craving for sensuality. In this case, it means just nice sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations to think about. A lot of our thinking goes there. And a lot of our sense of becoming goes around the pleasures that we would like to get in that way. So that leads to the second kind of craving, which is craving for becoming, i.e. having a sense of you in a world of experience. And then it's craving for non-becoming. You have a sense of you in the world of experience, and you don't like it. You'd be really happy to see it end. You do what you can to put an end to it. Well, as the Buddha said, simply having that desire, you're taking on an identity in another world, the world that sees this first world being destroyed. So that's the dilemma. You try to end states of becoming by wiping them out, and you just create more states of becoming, more craving for becoming. So what do you do? As he says, you try to see things as they have come to be, yata buddhi yana knowledge and vision of things as they've come to be, which basically means seeing the steps that lead up to the creation of that sense of you in that world of experience. This is what dependent core rising is all about. There's intention and there's attention. The most interesting factors in dependent arising are the ones that come prior to sensory contact. Intention, attention, perception, feeling. Directed thought and evaluation, even the way you breathe. If you take these things simply as events in and of themselves, you begin to see there's not much there. That's the level that the Buddha wants you to operate on before these things have a chance to become a state of becoming. Because as you get a sense of dispassion for them, it aborts any state of becoming that would come up. And as for the ones that are already there, they're going to end at some point anyhow. So this is how you work your way through that dilemma. But that means you have to catch these thought patterns or the activity of thinking as quickly as you can. Zap it as quickly as you can, so you can get it down to these raw materials. Then you can start dealing with the part of the mind that objects. You say, well, actually, using these raw materials to stay, create a state of becoming, that's kind of fun. Because there are times when you do get some pleasure out of it, but you have to keep thinking about all the suffering that goes with becoming. This is why it's good to keep the Buddha's awakening in mind. That's one of those events that 
it's always good to keep coming back to. There are some events that have happened in the world that have affected the state of the world for a while. But the Buddha's awakening has made a long-term change in the, our sense of possibilities here in the world. And part of it comes from the perspective he had of those first two knowledges, seeing all the times he died and been reborn and died again and been reborn again. Pleasure, pain, feeding, dying, pleasure, pain, feeding, dying, over and over and over again. When you think about that, it helps give you a sense of sangwega. And you begin to look at this process of becoming with a more jaundiced eye. And all the dialogues and narratives and monologues that you have around it that clutter up your mind. The way to deal with this is, on the one hand, try to replace some of the wrong views that are lie behind those monologues with right view. And secondly, learn how to take apart the process of thinking so you can see how arbitrary the whole thing is how insubstantial it is, and yet all the suffering that we can create out of insubstantial things. We tend to be proud of the fact that we can create all kinds of states of becoming to get the things that we decided that we want out of almost nothing. But then when you begin to realize, okay, there's a lot of suffering that you're creating out of nothing, and the suffering is real. I was listening to someone recently talking about how he, he has a Theravada monk had been studying some Mahayana texts, and at first it felt really offended by them because they were saying suffering is not real, suffering doesn't exist, the cause doesn't exist, the path doesn't exist. He thought, well, holding on to these views that we say are right, it's making me suffer, so maybe I should let go of them. That's the wrong attitude. As the Buddha said, Suffering is real. It's not other than what it seems. Craving really is the cause of suffering. The end of craving really does put an end to suffering. And this path that we're following really does work. It's that level of right view. Something you should hang on to, because it guides your efforts in the right direction. When you don't need it anymore, then you can, then you can let it go. But as long as you're suffering, you still need it. So try to inform your meditation with right view. These processes of creating thoughts do have a lot of potential for suffering, and you want to learn how to take them apart. Now, there will come times, of course, when you have to think. Look at the Buddha. He thought quite a lot. All those suttas, all those teachings he gave, it's not that he was on automatic pilot. He was thinking, but by that point he had learned how to think. As he said, he thought the th thoughts he wanted to think, and he didn't have to think the thoughts he didn't want to think. And he had a very clear set of values as to what was worth thinking and what was not worth thinking. And so to develop that same skill, we first have to learn how to not think, or de-think our thinking. And requires some thinking to do that. But make sure it's all thinking in line with right view. Any thinking that goes off in the wrong view, you've got to zap. And a good part of right view is knowing when you don't have to hold on to what you've remembered about right view. You pick it up when you need it as a tool, and then you put it down. It's like going into the kitchen. You're going to have lots of different utensils, all kinds of spoons and spatulas and pans and pots and things. And you know you're going to have to use them in the course of the day, but you don't carry them all around with you all the time. They have their places, and you pick them up when you need them, and you put them back down when you don't. So they're not weighed down. So think of right view that way. It's a whole series of utensils, 
all the factors of the path are different series of utensils. And your mindfulness is there to remind you that you have these things if you need them. And you want to get the mind into stillness, okay, you can put them down. All you have to remember is just stay still right here. Be ready to zap any thought that comes up as quickly as you can. That's not too much to keep in mind. And learn how to enjoy that. As the Buddha said, if you take delight in developing and delight in abandoning, that does an awful lot to keep you on the path. So as you're staking out the, the lair of this criminal, you don't have to suffer. You watch, you wait, and the criminal is bound to show his stripes. He's actually been showing his stripes all along, but you haven't seen the stripes because you've been looking other places. Your mind's been drifting off. When you get firmly established with your vantage point here, and take some delight in stepping back from all the different identities and dialogues and monologues that have been going on in your mind. Telling yourself, I don't have to participate in those anymore. And when you can pull yourself out of a particularly sticky one, there should be a good sense of accomplishment. And that should nourish you and keep you going. So you can take this as your sport. You can catch the criminal in action. See where he's guilty, and then the, get him sentenced, and then you can live in peace.